welcome back to Wicked Wands Tarot. My name is Carmen, and today we're going to talk about the movie Black Swan, directed by Darren Aronofsky, and how it demonstrated and portrayed and analyzed some of the key elements or themes that one would be talking about when looking at the divine feminine or divine masculine journey. I'm going to specifically be looking at it from a divine feminine standpoint, but I think for all of the masculine viewers out there, or those who are maybe more so in their divine masculine right now, keep in mind and please uh, post in the comments, there are going to be, you know, balancing components on the other side of the equation, right? So I don't want there to seem to be like we don't view Divine Masculine's journey as difficult, but we're going to explore the themes that Divine Feminines encounter. So within Black Swan, um, first of all, let's just talk about the trigger or like, you know, whether or not you've seen the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, don't watch my video because like I'm not going to listen to anybody talking about me ruining anything. But assuming you have watched the film, then I'm sure you understand that it was one of those very prov provocative type of films that finds a way to leverage incredible cinematography and imagery to tell a story that we can all relate to that really kind of guts you in a way. I would compare it to how I felt when I watched Requiem for a Dream, which I like to call the best movie I'd never like to see again, <laughs> in terms of really analyzing the grit underneath the human experience and how we react or interact with that, right? And that's what I liked about Black Swan. It is raw. And it begins with um, Natalie Portman's character envisioning the black swan lead role that she really covets, right? I think it was four years in a row that she had tried out for this titular role and she wasn't able to really clench that role because while she could demonstrate the purity of the white swan, she couldn't really demonstrate or portray the wild chaos behind the black swan. And for those of you who need a little refresher, the white swan would be kind of like the queen of cups energy, right? The sweetheart of the deck. That's somebody who's really, you know, probably motherly or seen as caring, loving, honest, willing to give the shirt off their back for you, right? Some would even consider this to be kind of like a passive energy. So Natalie Portman's character did an exceptional job portraying that element within her um, it called audition but then was called out by the director for not really knowing how to embody the black swan and for me I feel like the black swan is queen wand queen of wands energy gang gang uh, and that is to say he wanted to see Natalie Portman's character pull out of her not just that innocent pure I love you unconditional kind of energy, but demonstrate that throughout that experience of hers where she was rejected, she found that divine masculine within her, that ability to be more assertive, that ability to draw things in, that ability to harness your sexual power, right? And really I think the movie focuses on the sexual prowess element of the black swan equation more than anything else. I think at one point the uh, exceptionally talented French actor who plays the director, and I can't remember his name, I think at one point he literally just says, like, make me want to fuck you. And Natalie Portman's character is just too meek, too mild. And as the movie progresses, we find out that another core element on the Divine Feminine journey. The mother-daughter relationship that Natalie Portman has, sorry, I have a cat down here playing with things. <laughs> uh, the Natalie Portman character's relationship with her mother is odd. <laughs> I think as a female, I'm not a mother, I should clarify, but as a female, there's always this weird dynamic that mother and daughter 
like have to kind of traverse together, right? And the comfort or the alignment of perspectives from each individual, that's all gonna change over time, right? There's, I mean, if you're a dynamic individual, there were times where I didn't want to tell my mom anything about what was going on in my life. And then I felt more comfortable with who I was and didn't want to hide things. So it's felt really great to be more and more myself around my mom, who I consider my best friend, instead of having to kind of like live in an image created by her, which is really what Natalie Portman's character was doing at Black Swan. We see her bedroom at her mom's place, so of course she lives with her mom. In America, that's generally not common. Sorry, Hambone is attacking everything right now. Um, it's not very common, and so it does kind of have this undertone of attachment, right? Like codependency, really. And we find then, as the movie progresses, that her mother exerts quite a lot of control over her character, her, her life, you know? She can barge into her room at any time. Um, her character's name is Nina. I'll refer to her as Nina from here on out. And at one point, Nina gets so frustrated that a little bit of anger shows and that Queen of Cups energy slips for a moment. And that's how she gets the titular role from the director. Cause she bites him on the mouth when he kisses her during an audition, like a secret audition, right? It's just the two of them and she's trying desperately to prove, I've got this, I can do the black swan. And that lip bite clenched it for her and she got that title role. But what we begin to understand is perhaps that dysfunctional mother-daughter relationship that she has has led her to this point in terms of really struggling with the power dynamics and the relationships around her, speaking up for herself, establishing boundaries. She's the kind of person that would meekly say yes or be very willing to accommodate the needs of others before ever dreaming of somebody else actually accommodating her needs. So again, we're talking about a very, a very meek kind of energy. And that's perfect for the white swan, right? But as the movie progresses and she's working really hard to manage both the physical demands of the role and the emotional demands, she starts to see cracks and fissures in the relationships around her and it seems like nothing's real. Now she takes some drugs, which are provided to her by Mila Kunis's character, and that can definitely alter your perception of reality, right? I don't know if they actually say specifically what she does in the film, but I want to say it was Molly added to liquor, which doesn't seem like a great idea. Never done it. Feel free to tell me if I'm right or wrong. I don't care. But this is, you know, a very passive, meek, not party animal kind of girl who decides to take drugs and drink with someone she's just met at the dance company the night before she has to go back in and have a major you know, dance session for her role. But she wants to rebel against her mom. She perhaps gains some confidence as she, you know, learns that she's doing better with regards to her dance and gets more bold with her mom and bites back. Her mom tries to dismiss Mila Kunis's character from the door the night they decide to go out and party. And Mila isn't really loud when she's at the door, but when Nina's mom dismisses her, it's like, I think her, I think uh, Mila Kunis's character's name is Lily, but I can't remember for sure, so I'm probably just gonna keep calling her Mila. When Natalie Portman's character Nina realizes that her mom has just dismissed someone at the door and it could possibly be somebody for her, she goes, runs out in the hallway, finds Mila standing there, and decides to tell her mom to fuck off and go party. 
that's a huge step in the divine feminine journey. I respect your authority. I love you, mom, but I'm my own person and I'm gonna do what I want. I think it's really important for all of us to find a healthy balance between work and play, right? We all have goals and ambitions. We all have things that we want that would provide stability within our lives, but we also want a little bit of chaos, a little bit of spontaneity, right? So Nina decides to go out and party and then even further decides to knock back that drink with the drug in it and you're lost in this cacophony of red flashing lights, blue flashing lights, um, people making out, people dancing, and then Nina goes home to her mom's home, right? And brings Mila Kunis with her. They're both like gone, right? Like just, like I wouldn't even say like hysterical, not like in a bad, like losing my mind, like screaming, crying kind of thing, but they were giggling, they were having a great time, and Nina's mom wasn't really pleased and couldn't do anything about it. Nina decides to barricade her door so that her mom can't get into her room. Privacy. Independence. It's interesting how much society wants the Divine Feminine to believe that we depend on others. Shit. I depend on my government for health care and their opinion on my health care, not to get political. I simply want to underscore that in modern times, we have only scratched the surface when it comes to the perceptions that are associated with gender and sexuality that don't really serve us anymore and deserve to be questioned. I love that there are people who identify as non-binary now. Fuck you, society. I don't fit into your boxes, your stupid bubbles on your Scantron sheets. I'm a little of both. The fact of the matter is we are a little of both, all of us. Divine feminine, divine masculine. And Nina's search in this movie is for the divine masculine within her. How can I honor the femininity and the desire to mother and care with the desire for lust, for achievement, recognition, and boldness? How can I be empress and emperor? I want to be both. And Mila Kunis offers a beautiful girl and girl experience to help nudge Nina further along on that journey. Not only is this sexual experience something that helps Nina obviously understand her sexual side more, which is what the director has asked her to do, it also makes her feel rebellious. I've done something my mom doesn't want me to do. I've done something that maybe society still feels like I shouldn't do, but I liked it. And then she wakes up to find that her biggest competition at the dance com uh, company who fed her this drug is gone and probably already practicing and she has woken up late. She scurries off to the dance company and finds Mila Kunis' character dancing her dance in her absence. Jealousy. Jealousy is an ongoing theme for the Divine Feminine. It never goes away. There are people who don't feel empowered to make the changes that they want to make or that they dream about, fantasize about in their life. They think too small. I can't make this change because my parents would hate me. I can't make this decision because my ex 
would hate me. I can't, whatever it is, just stop saying those words, you guys. I can't doesn't have a place in your vocabulary. It might be a struggle. You might have to find a different path to the outcome that you want, but it doesn't. It does not mean that you can't do it. Do you know how many people have looked at me and told me that I couldn't do something? I just sat there and he smiled. Okay. I had an acquaintance tell me I was too old to learn something. Watch me. I had a friend tell me that I wouldn't be taken seriously because I was a female. And they didn't say this to be an asshole. They were probably right. Watch me. You can't stop me. If I want to do something, I'm going to fucking do it. The people who get stopped by those comments are the people who don't realize their dreams. They're the people who don't get into the history books for accomplishing something huge, right? There's an opportunity for all of us to leave our mark on this world, and a lot of that depends on your willingness to break out of the shell of society's conventional beliefs and expectations and telling everyone to fuck off, I'm gonna do it my way, because I know better. Why? Because I listen to my intuition, because I follow my calling. That's what Nina was doing, right? She was meant to be a dancer. She could dance that perfectly. So she shows up at that dance recital to find Mila Kunis dancing in her role. And she loses it. She begins to think that everyone believes that she's only gotten the role because she's sucked someone's dick or slept with someone. Because even Mila asked her that. Her supposed friend. Jealousy rears its ugly head in a myriad of ways, and one of those ways is commentary and subtle digs that are meant to make you question whether or not you're good enough. Hey, if you are somebody that cares about me and believes in my abilities, why do you want to cut me down? What purpose does it serve for you to see me reach less high in my goals? Oh, oh, it makes you feel better about yourself and your inability to chase your own dreams. Jealousy is an ugly, ugly bitch. The moment on your journey where you decide you no longer have to compare yourself to others because you are the shit and nobody's like you, life becomes real easy. Nina was fraught with insecurities that were brought on by attachments, codependencies, and a desire to be liked by everyone because she followed what was expected of her. As the anger brewed within her, at her friend and lover who had betrayed her, and at the mother who had stunted her growth and impacted how she could attach or connect with others emotionally, there was a rejection of whatever people wanted to make her do and she pushed away the advice that her mother gave her and she decided I'm going to do what I need to to be the person all on my own that I need to be to get what I need to get because all she ever wanted was to be that swan queen and Mila Kunis was threatening it. She finds a way to feel that pain and that beauty and transmute it. It's why I love to be an artist and why I hope many of you have some artistic expression, writing, drawing, dancing, 
when you have that artistic expression, you turn your pain into beauty. You process what you've been through. You show that even with the ugliness that I have survived, I still stand in my beauty and I'm not afraid to do so. There have been very ugly things that have been done to me, just like what Nina was demonstrating in that movie. People who wanted to control her, people who wanted to use her. I've gone through similar things and it's a conscious decision that I make every day to act the way I want to act, not act the way another person wants me to act. Yeah, you might want to poke the bear, insult me, make me jealous or make me feel like I'm not good enough for something. But when you have that white swan, black swan balance, when you have the dark and the light, the soft and the hard, the giving and the taking, you know exactly how to address the situation at hand. You can mirror other people to a certain extent, or I guess I would look at it as allow other people's behavior to inform the course that you take. Because when it comes down to it, I can be the most generous, caring, kind person. I literally want everyone to be happy. I literally want everyone to find love and heal and be in a state of appreciation for all the abundance that they've got in their life and the blessings that have come to them. I don't care what you've done to me. I'll still hope that you get there. Not everyone's like that. But because I know that, because I know that not everyone cares about anybody else, <laughs> I've had to find that black swan in me. Not because I want other people to look at me and say I want to fuck you. It's, it's you know, that's the movie version, right? I've had to find my own emperor or divine masculine within me because I don't ever want to feel like I'm risking codependency again. I believe that anything that is meant for me will be in my life and anything that is not meant for me will not be. Rejection is protection, 100%. The things that have not ended the way that I wanted to, when I look at them six months later, 12 months later, I have a whole different perspective and I realize how that rejection or that pivot was exactly what I needed in my life. There are people who wanted to like break me down and all it did is build me up. Just like Natalie, Nina. She gets pushed around, she gets bullied and she kind of loses it, right? I'm not saying you guys should lose it um, when it comes to mental health, I think that's a really important part of being a Divine Feminine is how can I stay on top of my healing and how can I make sure that the energy I put out is the energy I want back. Nina was still trying to figure that one out, but she delivered the performance of a lifetime. She fucking killed it. The black swan blew the white swan out of the water and was absolutely a different energy. When you're a divine feminine, you have to be able to leverage the white and the black swan within you. You have to be able to maintain that open heart chakra, that willingness to believe in the goodness in other people, that openness to trust again. But you also have to use your discernment. You have to use your discernment every time, every time. Because if you don't deserve the white swan in me, you'll get the black swan. And no, 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 that doesn't mean you get to fuck me. The black swan in me is the person that also is in charge of boundaries. The black swan in me is the one who isn't afraid to tell you that I like weapons. <laughs> I, I have said it before, I am love. 
but I also protect myself. And that's what the Divine Feminine has to do. That's what Nina had to do. She had to protect herself from the people that pushed her into codependency and attachments so that she could really stand on her own. Now, is Black Swan a great model to follow? No. But I really wanted to talk about the importance of duality, right? You have the meek and the powerful, the innocent and the devious, the pure and the sexual, the happy and the angry. I am all of those things and the Divine Feminine and the Divine Masculine is all of those things. It's about knowing when to leverage those energies at the right time and never changing who you truly are just because of external influences. Nina was still working on that, right? I really hope you guys post some comments below for me. This is definitely a little bit of a departure from the normal tarot readings that I do, but I love having these kinds of philosophical conversations. So please uh, do me a favor and give me a like if you want to see more of this kind of uh, content and then let me know what kind of thoughts you have because I'd love to have a discussion with you guys in the comments below. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day.